There we go. It started. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the June meeting of the Howard Astronomical League. Uh, it's great to see everybody here again today. I want to let everybody know that the meeting is being recorded and um, we'll make this available to everybody. It'll be available for a short period of time. It takes up a lot of uh, disk space. But um, and then Ken will send out an email uh, to the link once we have it uh, posted. So um, I want to also let you know today that they're doing something a little bit different. I didn't advertise it a lot, but I'm going to do this every month. So you, uh, let me share my screen here real quick. Share. Okay. So um, what we want to do is if you have something that, um, let me, I'm going to adjust my screen so I get a good, better view of the, all of you. Um, that if you have something that you are want to sell, give away, anything that's got to be related, um, and uh, do me a favor if you're not going to speak, put your uh, mics on mute uh, so we don't pick up the background noise, and then you could unmute yourself uh, at any time. So, um, using the chat. Uh, function that you'll be able to um, advertise to everyone uh, if you're if you have something you would like to sell give away um, or if there's something you're looking for you want to purchase or get some recommendation on that and so just open up the chat send the note to everyone but don't reply to everyone if you're responding because you'll see that you could just check on the uh, down arrow in the chat box and that'll bring up the specific person uh, that you want to talk to and you can see everybody's name on the screen so it'll be a good match and that way you can communicate just with that person back and forth on these particulars if you want to share a phone number or a home email address or, or whatever that is so this will be a good opportunity to to take care of that so once again you could advertise out to everyone that you're uh, trying to sell something or give it away or you're looking for something and then when if whoever's responding just go right to that mm -hmm. Person and have a private conversation. Uh, any questions on any of that? Okay, so um, let me go over here, make sure everything's working. So uh, here's our, our astral humor. I want to thank uh, Gordon Collins for uh, providing uh, this week's, uh, this month's. Uh... <coughs> Gordon, are you on? Don't see anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Hey, well, thank you, Gordon. Sure. There you go. <laughs> and uh, so, and we always uh, want to welcome any new members or guests. Do we have any new members today? Or in, in guest, Dominic, welcome. We can't hear you, Dominic. You may have to come back to give it a shot there. All right, well, raise your hand when you're right. Dominic, could you, you could hear us, but we can't hear you, right? So Dominic is a student of Michelle's. Uh, so um, trouble today because we can't hear him, so he's all good. But you know, we're with Michelle. So um, anybody else, any other new members or guests that are on today? Alrighty, so we'll move on here. So I'm very excited to announce that our in-person star parties are back. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, and this is for, for members only star parties. And it's also for um, public star parties and our first star party uh, in person again, since 2019 will be this coming Saturday. <clears throat> so here's where we are. So, uh, this Saturday is a public star party, and um, and the schedule is on our website, so you can see when all the rest of the uh, the uh, members only in the public oh, star parties are, and the impromptus are will pop up. If you're if you're not on the impromptu list, the Google Groups impo impromptu list, and you want to know when those parties are happening, uh, those get-togethers, you have to sign up for that list because we do not advertise that in the in the big group list. So here's what it's looking for like on Saturday. 
Uh, this is the uh, International Clear Sky Clock. Uh, there's a link to this also at the HAL website. And you could see that here's Saturday and uh, you know here's eight o'clock basically. And it's not looking that great. The darker the blue, the better the situation. But uh, it looks like we may have some patchy clouds or whatever, but this is a, uh, a rain or shine event. So um, there, I know there's quite a few people that have volunteered to come out with their telescopes, which is just great. Uh, the one thing I do want to remind everybody of is that uh, COVID-19 is still a real uh, situation. And if you are volunteering to bring your telescope out uh, for this event, uh, that means you're volunteering to have members of the public and other members of HAL come up and look through your telescope. And so you just need to, to manage that yourself. If you're not comfortable with that, then this would not be the event for you to bring your telescope out at, but it's completely voluntary. So, but we do have a, a good number of people that have volunteered to, to come out and it ought to be great. It, it has also been advertised uh, through Howard County to the community. So we will probably, like we always do, get some, uh, get, get a good number of people from the community to come out. Uh, so any questions on anything so far? Alrighty. Hey, Phil, this is Yvonne. I have a comment. Go ahead, Yvonne. How you doing? Um, yep, we can have telescopes, but if a person doesn't, isn't so inclined, they could also bring binoculars or just their planisphere. Right. Any kind of observing, right? Right. Yeah, you could come out. There's no reason not to come out. I'm just saying it's going to be, you know, if you're going to set up before 11 o'clock p.m., yep. uh, then be prepared to, you know, we don't want to turn members of the public away who come out for a public party and then say, well, this one's not available to look through. That's not the, the message that we want to, to send. So if you want to, if it was going to be a really, if it was going to be a much nicer, clearer night, you know, people will, we would stay out till we, however late the, uh, the hosts will, will be willing to stay awake. Um, and then you could set up for later in the evening after the uh, public star party is done. Yep. Also, no, I just wanted to mention that if it's um, what we've done in the past, if it's clouded and we can't even see the moon is, you know, you can set up a telescope just to point at one of the lights in the distance um, at the parking lot. And, you know, a lot of members of the public don't really understand what a telescope does. And just looking through a telescope and seeing that great big, light that you know is far away in the parking lot that in itself is educational and interesting so even if it's cloudy we still can have a good time out there right thank you very much a very good point and um, um i'm happy to announce uh, that i'm going to uh host uh an astro school in-person astro school um uh, and uh, it'll be in July 17th. Is it sounds far away? It's a, it's, a, it's a month away, but it was the first Saturday with uh, the Fourth of July holiday and Father's Day weekend and a lot of other things going on. So um, we're going to do that. I'm going to do it, at, uh, and it's also the same day as the July Public Star Party, which will be in the evening. So we'll have something in the morning and the uh, in the evening. This is for members only. Um, this Astro School, and uh, it'll be for solar observing and imaging. So I'm going to do a whole session on um, the, uh, you know, what you're actually looking at with the photosphere and the chromosphere, uh, the difference between white light and hydrogen alpha, uh, safety, polar aligning during the daytime, um, and then get into imaging and imaging techniques. So um, I've scheduled it from uh, nine o'clock a.m. till noon my and mobile unit what's that so we have a question so i have a question go right ahead so um could you remind how you join as a member in case somebody i know wants to join yes no problem at all so if you would like to join as a member um just go to the hell website it's howard astro um it's HowardAstro.org is uh, the website, and um, you just go right to the membership tab, and, and it's pretty self-explanatory from there. So, um, so yeah, we'd love to have you uh, for free to guess. Um, How much is it? It's, uh, it's, it's $25, 
per person per year. So, or if you want to sign up your whole family, it's thirty dollars for the entire family for the year. So, and you just take care of everything right online. You pay with a credit card or pay or PayPal, and uh, it's all instantaneous there. And then we'll, um, you know, and then make sure you opt in to the different mailing lists and stuff so you see the announcements. Uh, Ken, or uh, anything else that I should be saying about that for the sign up? Uh, Ken, you're on mute. Well, the membership you. thing is under the Hail Info. Uh, then, like a couple, couple uh, tabs down is the membership information right. and how to sign up. And then there's also links for joining the email lists. Thanks. And if you those of us the, that can't uh, remember, does it all uh, membership uh, address from this from this meeting tonight? Just Google uh, astronomy clubs in Howard County, and you'll take it. <clears throat> does it auto renew? I cannot remember. You'll get a um, no. It doesn't auto renew, but you'll get a, a reminder email uh, about a month before your membership expires, and um, and then you can just go right on and, and take care of. It. You could sign up for one year or three years or a lifetime membership. So, any other questions on that? Great, I look forward to it. The club is, um, I don't know, I didn't check the exact count uh, this morning, but we're, we're, we're right around 300 members. So we have a real, really uh, significant membership and it's, it's just great. Hello, Marty. So Marty, the call is being recorded, so please be careful what you say. Thank you very much. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm really looking forward to this uh, um, solar observing and imaging uh, astro school. Uh, I've had, as if you, for those of you who are following the uh, Google Groups conversation, you could see that there's there's people that are certainly interested in this. And, um, and I'm also gonna encourage everybody, if you have a solar scope, a solar filter to bring that with you so you could use your own uh, equipment and get comfortable with it and be there to help. And I'm sure there'll be others who, who have experienced doing this will be willing to help too. So that'll be Saturday, July 17th, and I'll send out reminders as it gets closer. And um, I don't think we have anything uh, uh, going on um, that much uh, for some for some big uh, officer report. Once again, like I always do, is I can't thank enough all of our volunteers, our officers, and our committee uh, <laughs> chairs. Um, <laughs> work that they do that um, keep us running and keep us vibrant and make the club fun and informative for all of you. So uh, are there any um, officers or committee people that have something you'd like to report this month? Okay, not hearing anything. We're gonna continue. To uh, yep. well David, there. I'm sorry, I I missed where your uh, solar observing. Uh... It's going to be at uh, Alpha Ridge. I don't. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, we, we can't do it at Panera. We'll take up the parking lot. So. All right. So um, I'm going to. What, what the what the plan is going to be for today is we're going to move uh, in just a moment to our guest presenter and uh, who's uh, Jim Johnson. And what I, before I do the official uh, introduction for Jim, I do want to say uh, his, his topic is, is eclipses. And um, so what I've done is we, we recently had a partial eclipse and I've uh, moved those pictures up to the front in front of uh, Jim's presentation today to kind of give it a teaser, move it in, and then we'll do the rest of the images that have been submitted after Jim's uh, presentation and all the Q&A. So um, I'm, I'm not gonna ask everybody to go, you know, Ken and, and, and James and stuff to go through your pictures here, but I do wanna show them off um, and we can come back and talk about them later. Uh, but so here's a, here's a really beautiful picture that Ken Everhart took. And um, here's another one, uh, which is really kind of a interesting picture because it looks like it's upside down, doesn't it? but it's not. And then here's another one going behind the trees. Just beautiful. And then here's from James Willingham. There you go. 
So we got some, some of the members, some of you guys uh, really got some nice chats. And this is really beautiful. This is one of my favorites of all time of any picture. Uh, so, so as we uh, get going here to, to, to move into with our, with our next uh, uh, group, I do, with our next uh, session with, uh, with Jim Johnson, who's our presenter. Let me uh, introduce Jim for those of you who don't know him. Uh, Jim is a, um, a longtime member of HAL and he's a past president of, of HAL. And he is um, been, you, you may have, if you participated in our virtual, um, in our virtual star parties, Jim was one of the people out there uh, with his telescope out there sharing his views and sharing information. He's always there for any of us and all of us when you have a question or a need, he's, he's like, uh, uh, volunteers all of the time. He's presented to us in Astro schools and uh, on eclipses of a couple of years ago after, uh, after one, he'll talk about more of that later on. And he's really uh, a great person and a great friend to have for, for, for all of us. And tonight, I'm just gonna read what uh, was in the synopsis. Uh, uh, Jim's presentation is gonna be on the Great North American, there we go, on the, uh, the Great North American Eclipse of uh, 2024. Uh, the Amateur Astronomer's Guide to Solar Eclipses. The Great North American Eclipse of 2024 is our next readily accessible opportunity to witness uh, firsthand one of the most grand of all astronomical phenomena, a total solar eclipse. As it is less than three years away and careful planning is required for a successful experience, now is a great time to start getting ready. Approaches, there will be much said about the eclipse in the press and social media and discussions among amateur astronomers like us. This talk will provide the foundational material for interpreting this coverage and for formulating travel and by exploring high and wide solar eclipses occur, what an observer can expect to see. Uh, this will be a first in a series of topics on the 2024 eclipse. Part two of the topic will revisit the Great American Solar Eclipse of 2017 um, and the presentation to explore how HAL members and guests prepare for the eclipse and travel to the eclipse viewing sites. The problems that they encounter, what they learned four years ago and how those lessons may be applied to preparations for the 2024 eclipse. For part three, the ultimate goal of the series, a similar presentation will be prepared that documents our collective 2024 eclipse experience. Stay tuned for the date of that presentation. So I'd like to turn this over. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Jim can share his. And Jim, thank you very much for presenting today and it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Phil. <clears throat> uh, just a few words to tie what I'm gonna talk about today to the images that uh, Phil just showed. They were from the eclipse last Friday, the, um, the annular or ring of fire eclipse, uh, what we saw on those photos. I don't know where Ken and James uh, image from, James from New Jersey, I don't know where Ken was, but generally here and uh, on the East Coast of North America, all we saw was a partial eclipse that was on the way out. The moon was on the way out of the sun um, as it rose. So we didn't see a whole lot, but we did uh, get a couple of nice pictures from that. So we'll talk more about what that, um, what a partial eclipse is and what a uh, ring of fire or annular eclipse is as well. Let me see if I can get my screen going here. I don't know what to do with that. Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Yes. All good. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is going to be part one of a three part series that. Um, you know, this part is going to concentrate on what an eclipse is, what it takes for one to happen, um, where and how to, to view it. And it's all, as the um, uh, top part of the title says, about getting ready for the uh, Great North American Eclipse of 2024 coming up on April the 8th of 2024. Um, uh, just saw one of Ken's images. The background that I have on here is a kid image from Ken of the uh, 2017 uh, uh, Great American Eclipse. And you'll see that on all the slides and you'll probably see more of 
his original photograph. So um, eclipses are very rare. And the one that's coming up in 2024 is our next opportunity to see one um, without traveling halfway around the world. Um, it's, it is only about three years away, a little bit less. So now to start, now's a good time to start getting ready. And, and by getting ready, what that means today is to be able to understand what an eclipse is and how to interpret what you're uh, hearing in the media, hearing um, um, among discussions between HAL members and guests on howardastro.org. And, uh, and so that you can start planning your own eclipse ex experience. Um, I do hope to make the point here today that um, um, an eclipse is a very uh, rare and wonderful thing to see. Um, uh, first of all, there's not that much of them, and many of them, and and they're and compared to anything else that you'll see in the um, in our sky, the, the eclipse the eclipses all of them. Uh, this is a graphic that Wayne contributed to to the post 2017 um, um, presentation, and you can see how cool it sounds like it would be and how cool it is to see in person. You kind of compare those two things and plot them out. And you can see things like planetary conjunctions, although I would say the Jupiter-Saturn uh, conjunction of last December was uh, probably a little bit up and to the right compared to uh, most of those things on there. Super moon is, you know, it's really the moon and a lunar eclipse. Uh, sometimes it doesn't, if it's partial, you don't see much at all. And a partial solar eclipse, um, you know, those are cute and everything, but until you see a total solar eclipse, uh, you really haven't seen the, the main um, the main event. Um, to me, this was a bucket list item and I saw the first one in 2017 and I've got to see the, uh, the next one. So, and really to see one, all you have to do is just be in the right place at the right time and look up. So this is an eclipse sequence, um, and it's basically starting at the right, you see the full sun, and then the next uh, image of the sun, you see a little bit being taken out of it, and a uh, bigger bite as you progress to the right. And finally, when you get to the center, you see the corona pop out, and then as time progresses, the moon starts coming um, off of the sun in the other direction, and basically unwise, unwinds in the opposite direction. So all those um, uh, photos of the sun before totality, those are um, a partial eclipse. Um, if you're not in the path of totality, that's all you're gonna see is some, uh, some portion of that, but you gotta be in the path and we'll talk about what that means to actually see totality and the corona. And, and actually I can promise you, if you've never seen this before, or maybe even if you have, you're, you're gonna lose your mind when you see it. Uh, there's another image. That's probably the closest one that I could find what I actually saw looking up in the sky. The sky is a, a deep, deep blue. Uh, you can see stars. Uh, the, the darkness of the moon in front of it is just, just looks like the, the universe is ripping wide open and you're going to be sucked up into the sky. But I, tell you, I, I just completely lost my mind when I saw it. So that's the... Um, just a hint at how much more spectacular a total eclipse is than a partial one. Um, Word to caution, anytime that we're talking about the sun, you just need to be protected properly, have proper filtration and or solar glasses or filters on your scope or over your camera. Um, because the sun, especially when you're magnified, it can do um, permanent damage uh, almost immediately. So uh, you don't want to risk that. Um, and don't wait till the last minute. There was um, a big rush towards the end. I think we got uh, glasses for everybody that wanted them in the day, days before the, um, the eclipse. But don't wait till the last minute to get them. And there'll probably be a lot of information out there about what's safe and what's not. But I'll be more current than anything that I could uh, show you today. So I won't get into specifics there. So, eclipse fundamentals. I, um, 
here's the here's the basics. A new moon is always that um, is always lunar phase at the time of eclipse. Uh, basically, that for there to be an eclipse, the sun, the earth, and moon align so that the moon's disk covers the sun as viewed from the observer's position on Earth. Uh, the eclipse can be partial, uh, the top of the right-hand graphic there, and just similar to what James and Ken uh, shared with us in their images. It can be total, that's the center image, uh, basically where the moon completely covers up the sun, blocks out all of its harsh light so that you can see the uh, corona. Or it can be an annular eclipse. Uh, that's going to be the bottom one where the moon is appears smaller than the sun, and you still see that ring of fire around the edge. You do not see a corona with a ring of fire eclipse. You still got too much bright light coming off the sun. Even that little bit just shows you how bright the sun is. Just that little bit is going to keep you from uh, seeing the corona and all the magnificence of a total eclipse. Um, all solar eclipses begin as partial, um, a total eclipse or a annular eclipse um, begin as partial. You'll see in the hour or so before the uh, before totality, you'll see the moon slowly slide over the sun and block it out. And eventually it will cover it up completely if you're in the, the right path and then it'll move off uh, the other side. Let's talk about some of the components of an eclipse, some of the things that you'll see and how they and how they relate. So I'll probably talk about a couple of things and then I'll show a, a graphic um, afterward to follow up on that. Actually, I could probably uh, skip straight to the uh, graphic here. These, these words will be here for anybody that wants to um, come back and read this later once it gets posted. Um, take away from this slide is the apparent diameter of the photosphere or the sun, you can say is about a half a degree. If you hold up your um, your pinky at arm's length, not, not in like this, but out all the way out at arm's length and close one eye, about half the width of your pinky is, um, is a half a degree. Your pinky is about one degree. And uh, that's about how big the uh, photosphere of the sun is. Let's go on down and uh, look at the graphic. So this is like a, um, I, I like to think of when we're talking about the outer layers of the sun or its atmosphere, I like to think of it as an orange. Um, so inside you've got the core where all the heat and uh, energy is produced and a radiative zone, we can't see that. Convective zone, that's all uh, uh, underneath of it. But when we put a white light filter on our, um, on our uh, camera or telescope, um, just like out here, you see uh, this layer, of the this inner layer of the atmosphere here called the photosphere. This is where all the light comes from, all the white light comes from. If you think about an orange when you peel it and it's got, um, got the white stuff uh, underneath, that's kind of what I envision um, as the photosphere being like. The peel that goes on top of that, where's my pointer? There it is. That goes on top of that real thin layer uh, that um, emits in the hydrogen alpha um, wavelengths. And um, it's just another layer on top of it. Uh, the photosphere is so uh, bright. And here's a, um, an image from Phil of um, uh, the chronosphere. That's where you see promises. You see all kinds of features uh, on the sun. But you got to block out all that white light. That's what Phil's uh, special solar scope does. And then outside of the uh, coronasphere, you, uh, chromosphere, you have the corona. And this is Ken's um, image from the 2017 eclipse, um, high dynamic range um, image where he put, took a lot of dim and uh, short exposures and long exposures to capture the features. Uh, the very fine features of the um, uh, corona. So that's what's on the outside. And you can't see that corona until the moon is blocking out all that harsh light from the photosphere so that the, um, so that the sky is now dark enough that you can see the 
um, uh, Corona. Well, let's talk about some of the key components of the moon. So, so look at there, the apparent diameter of the moon is at half a degree again, pinky, half your pinky at um, arm's length. The moon casts a two, two part cone shaped shadow and that's because uh, the sun is so much larger than the moon. Uh, the, um, the sun, if I remember correctly, is like 900,000 miles in diameter compared to the moon being uh, five, six, seven, eight thousand, I don't remember, but much, much smaller. Um, um, but because of that, the size differences, the moon cast a, um, a, a two-part conical sh uh, shadow. Uh, the first part, the outer part, is the penumbra. Um, you can see it um, um, covers a large portion of the Earth's surface. This happens because uh, this part of the sun down here um, is can still be seen from this part of the earth and from this this part of the sun light from it can still be seen on this part of the earth but here in the middle um, uh, directly underneath the moon is called the umbra so this is the part where the sun's total light is blocked out and if you're standing um, at this point on the earth when the shadow passes over you the sun will be completely blocked by the moon and you'll be able to see the corona. So let's talk about geometry and orbits a little bit uh, associated with these solar eclipses. Um, one of the magic things that happens here is uh, because the sun and the moon are both about a half degree in diameter, um, that happens because uh, the sun is, a, and they're both about the same size as the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, and the sun is 400 times farther than the moon. So the farther the sun gets away, the smaller it gets. Moon being closer appears nearly as large as the sun. It's kind of like the, is, is, that a, is that a Doberman pincher way over there, or is that a a chihuahua up close to that kind of thing. So uh, talking about the orbits, uh, adhering to Kepler's first law, let me go on to the graphic here, I think. Uh, I'll go back to that. Um, orbits are elliptical. Uh, they have a, um, in the case of the moon orbiting the earth, it has a perigee. Um, over here on November 9th, and oh, um, two weeks later, 14 ish days, has an apogee. And you can see that the Earth is not in the center of that ellipse, it's off to one side. Um, and so the moon it, in, in 28 ish days, 29 ish days, uh, passes close to the Earth and um, it's, it reaches its closest point to the Earth and its farthest point. Um, at its closest point, the moon's gonna appear larger. That's a super moon. Uh, and these are the comparisons of uh, being at perigee and being at apogee. Uh, the moon is so much smaller uh, when it's at apogee. So um, this is how you get a, a total eclipse when the moon is uh, much larger, usually larger than the sun. You get a total eclipse like on the perigee side of the um, moon's orbit, come over here to the apogee side on the left, and you can see that because the moon is smaller, um, it happens to be smaller than the sun, you still get that ring of fire um, where you see the photosphere all the way around the moon, you get no corona. Let me back up a slide. Back up this one for a second. Okay. So we kind of already talked about this. Uh, a partial eclipse is visible to observer from within the moon's penumbral shadow. shadow. An annular eclipse occurs when the observer, uh, the moon and the sun are perfectly aligned and the parent size of the sun is, the moon is smaller than the sun. So we saw that, we've got the ring of fire eclipse. And then a total solar eclipse occurs when the, uh, again, when the sun and moon are perfectly aligned 
but the observer is within the umbral shadow. The moon is a, the moon is larger than the sun in apparent size. Should emphasize that. Sun is much bigger physically, actual size than the moon. It's just that the distance distances give us different apparent sizes of the sun and moon on the celestial sphere. We talked about that in one of my um, astro schools. So why are eclipses so rare? And and an alternate question is why is there not an eclipse at every new moon? Let's explore that just a little bit, and then we'll get into what an eclipse looks like. So we have this construct on the celestial sphere called a um, called the elliptic. It's, uh, it contains the zodiacal constellations that you can see in the graphic, all 12 of them. And they're kind of aligned in the same plane in the sky. Um, it's a closed um, circle. It's basically the path of the sun traces among the fixed stars over the course of the year and it traces that um, apparent path because the earth is actually orbiting the sun and you just get a different perspective as you move through time so let's look at uh it's june right now so if the um if the the, the earth would be here at june and if we could see the stars behind the sun go past right through the sun we would see the sun is in the constellation Gemini. Um, and as we move to July, now the sun has moved to Cancer. We moved to August. So that's the basic path. That's, the, that's called the ecliptic. It's also referred to as the plane of the Earth's orbit. And um, this is also the circle upon uh, which eclipses occur. And that's why it's called the ecliptic. We'll talk about why that happens in just a second. So the moon's orbit, the moon has an orbital path and it has its own plane, but that plane is inclined to the ecliptic by about 5.15 degrees. I have a graphic to show you about that. Because that orbital plane is inclined to the ecliptic, um, the moon crosses the ecliptic twice in each of its um, roughly 28 day orbits. Um, if it's crossing from the uh, south to the north, that's called the ascending node. And if that happens um, on whatever day, about 14 ish days later, you get the descending node. About halfway in between, the moon is inclined or is actually positioned uh, north or south of the um ecliptic by that same by that five point uh, one five degrees that the orbit is inclined so let's see what that looks like so in this graphic the reference plane would be the ecliptic that's basically the one that's the most important to us um, as we see the sun um, um, move through the zodiacal constellations across among the uh, fixed stars in the background the um, the plane that the gray bluish gray plane that's labeled, just labeled orbit that would be an example of the the moon's um, orbit being and it's inclined uh, the angle between the two planes like let's say looking at the ascending node between the reference plane or the um, the ecliptic and the moon's orbit that would be the five point one five degrees and when the moon's out here. Um, halfway between the two nodes, um, the, the moon will appear in the sky about 5.15 degrees uh, off of the ecliptic. Um, I'm not sure why I'm getting moving there. Um, so you can see that in the course of the moon's orbit, it goes through its, its ascending node, ascends until it's um, positioned 5.15 degrees uh, north of the ecliptic. And it starts descending. It passes through the descending node, and um, and and then uh, when it gets around to this point, now it's positioned 5.15 degrees south of the um, ecliptic. Um, and it's only on these two points, the ascending and descending nodes. Um, if you have a new moon, while the sun is very close to the ascending node. 
So that's the only time that you're going to get an eclipse. So, so I start talking about where you need to be to see an eclipse. So the total eclipse path is described that it's often a very long path. Um, we'll I'll show a graphic of that. They're very, very long compared to how wide they are. It, you know, it might be hundreds of miles long, ten, maybe tens of miles wide. Uh, the the path for the 2017 eclipse was like uh, around 70 miles wide. The one coming up, up in 2024, I believe it's going to be like 110 miles wide. Um, and, and that path covers a very limited portion of the Earth's surface. That's because of the, uh, the conical shape of the umbral shadow. Uh, we're basically at the, at the apex of that cone are very close to it. And, um, and that's why the path is so narrow compared to how long it is and how big, how large the Earth's surface is. Um, in the case of the two eclipses that I just mentioned, the, uh, uh, the moon's apparent size is going to be larger for the 2024 eclipse, hence the um, 110 miles wide of the uh, path of totality compared to the smaller apparent size of the moon in 2017, where we only got about uh, 70, a path about 70 miles wide. Uh, the moon's shadow may take uh, an hour or more to move from the beginning to the end of this path. And the duration at any point on the path is very short. Uh, it could be seconds to many minutes, uh, depending upon the apparent size of the moon compared to the sun. In 2017, Working from memory, uh, totality in most places lasted about uh, two minutes and 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, the one in 2024, I believe totality at the center of the path is going to run about four minutes. So you get to see the, uh, uh, the magnificent eclipse and the corona for a longer period of time. So you must be on the path to experience totality. If you're, uh, if you're off the path, you, the best that you're going to see is a, um, a partial eclipse. You'll never see the corona. Uh, the greatest duration of totality is observed on the center line of the path. In 2017, I was probably about 150 feet off the center line. So I, I basically got almost the very best experience I could get probably didn't even lose more than a second. Let's see. So here's a graphic showing the 2024 eclipse. You can see the, uh, the path um, uh, enters at the bottom left of the uh, graphic in, in Mexico, crosses into Texas and sweeps across to the Northeast, uh, touching parts of Canada and, and Maine before it exits in the North Atlantic. Uh, so you can see that the, the path has a, a width dimension. Uh, it's probably exaggerated a little bit here, I think. Um, but the center line is where you're going to have the the blue line in the middle. The center line is where you're going to have the, um, the the greatest duration of totality. Uh, this circle here, the red circle, represents uh, where the Moon's umbral shadow cone intersects your surface. So because the moon's going to be relatively close and bigger, that circle gets bigger and the path gets wider. Uh, something to know about this, like I've already said that the, um, uh, path, the uh, greatest duration will be on the center line. If you're right here on the edge, you're just going to, the, the shadow's going to, pay, this shadow's moving like um, hundreds of miles, 1,500 miles an hour, I think. So you're just going to get a little blip. Uh, you really got to be um, on the center line or close to it to really get the full effect of the um, of the eclipse. Let me back up and peek at my last slide for a second. Okay. So let's uh, look at why they're so rare. We look at the, uh, the conditions necessary for an eclipse. You basically need four things. Uh, the moon's phase must be new moon. 
and the moon must be crossing the ecliptic on the ascending or descending node of its orbit, and the moon's apparent size must be larger than the sun, and the observer must be on the path of totality. So that's a lot of things that's got to line up uh, before you experience a um, a total eclipse. And that's why they're so rare. And this opportunity for us to uh, drive a couple hundred miles to see one is just a, um, a, a huge opportunity for us. Let's talk about the eclipse Do you phases. want to eat while we watch? So um, the, the phases are um, called out in terms of contacts. Uh, very similar to a uh, transit of Mercury or Venus. Uh, first contact, you can see all the way to the left of this graphic. Um, uh, this is actually well past first contact. When the moon's disk first just touches the edge of the sun, that's first contact. And then that's when the, um, you know, the moon just starts to overlap the sun and it's going to move. If you're on the path of uh, totality over the course of an hour or so it's going to uh, slowly move over the sun covering more of it as time goes on um, until you get to second contact uh, this is not quite second contact so you can still see the sun here but at second contact that's when you're at totality and the, um, and the corona just blossoms out just seemingly out of nowhere and after the um, duration that for your particular location, so the moon will start to move off of the sun. You'll start to see uh, first a small crescent, and then as time goes on, and that's called third contact when you when the when you see the corona, uh, the photosphere again, and that will progress for about another hour or so, hour and a half, and then finally the uh, fourth contact, uh, the moon is completely off of the sun, and the eclipse is over. So let's explore those um, a little more and explore what you can see and um, at each one of those phases. So as we just mentioned, um, first contact begins as the lunar disk takes its first nibble of the solar disk. Um, if there are sunspots uh, present, they'll be visible. If you're looking um, at the sun with, or should be looking with, um, uh, filtration for safety, but you'll be able to, with um, white light filters, you'll be able to see sunspots. We'll be well into the um, 11 year solar cycle when the next eclipse comes. So I'm pretty sure that there will be some uh, sunspots, um, plenty of sunspots visible. Um, the eclipse is said to be solar, uh, partial, while the lunar disk ingresses between the first contact and second contact. That's actually the beginning of it. First contact to second contact. That's called the ingress side of the eclipse. If you're on very high ground, uh, we had one HAL member who was for the 2017 eclipse, actually um, recorded the moon's shadow racing across the, the ground on the, uh, the lower ground below. Uh, so you, you can actually see the shadow approach on the ground. You can actually see it in the sky as well. Um, um, it's, it's just, it's just there, uh, but you'll see that that shadow approaching as you, um, a second contact approaches. Other things you'll see in the final stages of, um, of, uh, the, the partial phase, you'll see a diamond ring effect. And as the last of the photosphere is just before the last of the photosphere is covered by the lunar disk, and you'll see some. Bailey's beads, those are just little bits of um, the photosphere that are exposed in some of the lower valleys that are on the um, properly aligned on the lunar limb. Hey, Jim. Yes. Can I jump in with something real quick? Yeah. So on the uh, diamond ring effect, um, if you haven't seen a solar eclipse and you haven't seen that, that is a flash. Um, yes. That's something that lasts for the entire time that you're looking at the eclipse. Uh, at any time, and um, uh, I was looking at it through a large telescope, and when that flash happened, it blew my eye off the eyepiece. 
Um, it happened so quickly and it was so bright and it was so cool, but uh, you, you, it's like, if you blink, you miss it. And um, so it's something worth, you know, preparing for when you're watching the eclipse. And Bailey beads will hang on for the duration of the total totality, but uh, the, the diamond ring effect is quick. Thanks, Jim. Yes, yes it is. And uh, one of the things that we'll talk about in our, um, in part two of this, not um, is how to um, be prepared for that. But if you can surprise you, you get carried away, you get wrapped up in the eclipse, and you, and you don't see that. Okay, so that's um, those are the main things that you're going to see when you're looking um, up at the eclipse um, as it progresses from uh, first contact to second. Here's some of uh, some uh, images from our um, some of our members from the 2017 eclipse. Um, you can still the white part here is photosphere. You actually see all three parts of the sun's atmosphere. You see the photosphere right here. You see a prominence right there. That's uh, um, material from the chronosphere uh, being. Um, uh, pushed out away from the sun. And then you see the corona. You can see stars. Uh, maybe I might be pointing at dust on my screen. I don't know. You can actually see stars and planets that are in the sky. Um, so that's uh, from Jim Tomney and Steve Stewart. Uh, here's Wayne's Bailey's beads. And again, you can see, so anything white is a photosphere. You can see Chronosphere here, uh, here, that you see there. And Joe, um, uh, Joe Bohannon uh, labeled this uh, diamond ring. I, th I think that most people would call something where you still see part of the, uh, you're not really seeing the chronosphere or corona yet, you're seeing still part of the photosphere. But uh, there's Joe's uh, image from 2017. So let's talk about second contact. Let's uh, totality. Uh, this is the main event. So the difference, the difference between a partial and total eclipse, you have to see it to appreciate it. Uh, be aware ahead of time. You might squeal or scream. I think I did both, and maybe I jumped up and down a little bit. Um, but uh, don't worry, you won't be consumed by that impossibly dark uh, disc in the center. And, um, and you won't be the only one uh, squealing and screaming and jumping up and down. This is the, the main event for a um, total solar eclipse. So the corona is the main part of this. Um, and because we'll be at that 11 year solar cycle uh, peak, uh, peak activity, the corona is likely to be substantially uh, large. Um, um, but um, you won't see it until you get to second contact. Um, and it just, if I, my, my experience was I looked up, I probably at the very last sliver of the uh, photosphere was about to slide over the moon and then just bam, it was gone and then it, the corona was was there, and uh, I still can't believe it to this day. Um, although the moon looks impossibly dark at the center of the corona, um, lunar features are illuminated by um, Earth's shine. That's uh, sunlight reflecting off of the Earth's surface onto the side of the moon that's um, away from the sun but toward us. Um, you can take deep exposures, long exposures to um, uh, to capture that, I think I might have had an image of that. Um, uh, some things to look for is, um, and I'll point it out in uh, the background image that I use of Ken's here. Um, you'll see streamers that are aligned with the solar equator, um, which would be these longer ones uh, that reach out away from the sun. And they have uh, part, parts uh, where the uh, streamers are more sparse and shorter. Uh, those are aligned with the solar uh, poles, the sun's rotational axis. Um, 
it's possible to look at um, uh, things like solarium and, and figure out exactly how those are going to be aligned. So somebody that's interested in taking images can um, align their camera um, along the long axis of the um, across the axis of the sun's equator. So you can get more of the corona in there. You might see, I don't know if I can or not, but um, you look in Ken's image down here in the lower left and see a lot of curvature and and maybe some looping there. It's possible to see looping of the streamers. Uh, we've already seen images of solar prominences and flares that are present to be seen around the limb. And if there are, um, there are planets in the sky and stars, and we'll talk about that in part two, what's actually going to be out there uh, that you should make a note to uh, look for. You can see them. Um, just telling you ahead of time, uh, Orion, I expect you'll probably be able to see the uh, the whole constellation that'll be up. Um, and I already talked about the uh, face of the moon being visible in longer exposures. There's uh, James Willingham, we, we call this one the eclipsed dolphin. And again, you can see um, uh, the photosphere, just really, just really brilliant there. The red chronosphere in here and then the prominence uh, coming up. Uh, it's from Keith Evans. Um, I, I think that we're seeing the cursor keeps disappearing. I think we're seeing photosphere and chronosphere, uh, chromosphere and corona in this one. This is a very long exposure. You can see how the corona is um, almost, you're losing all the detail in here because it's exposed so long, but look at how long the streamers are on this because of the long exposure. Um, Maybe looping there, I'm not sure. But you, in this deep exposure, you can actually see features on the um, on the dark side of the moon, uh, which is what is facing us at new moon, and especially during a total solar eclipse. So totality ends at third contact. That's when the um, the other side of the sun just peeks out from behind the moon. Uh, the eclipse will be partial again during the lunar disk egress between third and fourth contacts. You'll see in reverse order Bailey's beads and the diamond ring effects and then the eclipse eclipses over at fourth contact. Um, uh, my experience in 2017 was that um, it was rather anticlimactic. Um, People were packing up cars and leaving, and some people stayed and um, observed the um, the moon's egress after the eclipse. Um, and I found that that was a perfectly good thing to do because traffic uh, was was horrible. We'll talk about that in part two. Okay, so what do you see when you're on the on the surface of the Earth? You'll see the as the um, progress eclipses through the partial phase, you'll see darkening of the sky. Uh, temperatures will actually drop noticeably. Um, you'll see shadows sharpening, the light just looked a little weird. Uh, this is because the uh, sun is a half a degree in, um, in diameter and it just makes a, um, makes a blur between the full sunshine and the um, and the full um, full shadow of, of an object. So that blur just kind of goes away as more and the more and more of the um, sun is covered by the moon. Um, uh, you don't really notice the darkening so much until the very end. I think that's because your eyes adjust, but um, at the very end, it'll start getting uh, really dark and in a hurry. And then bam, there's your uh, corona. You'll see animals preparing for nightfall. Um, 
if you look at the horizon, you'll see uh, the 360 degree sun hit, sunset. It'll be, you know, you see that reddish sunset glow that it'll be all the way around the horizon. And I think that only happens if you're uh, positioned near the eclipse center line during totality. And shimmering bands on the ground. I know we had some folks that saw that. I didn't see it. I had a white cloth on the ground, but I didn't see anything. So let's uh, look at some images here. So this shows shows you a lot of stuff. So you see the, the deep blue sky. You see the sunset on the horizon. Um, and you can see the sun in the... Um, uh, in the partial phases before and after the eclipse. I'm not sure which way uh, this one is moving. And then over on the right, you see some shadow bands on a piece of cloth that somebody uh, put out on the on the ground. I think Wayne might have, Wayne, did you see shadow bands? Yeah, well, my wife did. Okay. She saw them at, we were on a dirt road and it was a light sandy color and she could see the shadow bands. Okay, so let's talk about some observation methods. Um, during the uh, partial phases, the, um, the pinhole projection is the absolute easiest, safest way to see the eclipse. You can see sunspots as well. You can just watch the progress of the moon uh, sliding over the, um, the disk of the sun. Uh, you can see sunspots in, through a pinhole projection. Some people got really fancy. They made up things where putting head your head in a box so that you uh, the the image that you see projected is uh, gives you a lot of contrast. Um, many many variations of that. That's something that you'll see more of as um, you get closer to the eclipse. Um, you can observe it with a telescope with a proper filter. You can do it in white light or in uh, hydrogen alpha. Um, uh, they're both very, uh, produce very interesting, um, uh, but different uh, kinds of images. Uh, photographic, uh, various filters and equipment are used depending upon the effects to be captured. You can take, um, uh, Long exposures to get more of uh, the outer detail, the um, the corona, like the finer filaments, or you can take shorter to get the detail in closer to the sun. Um, a lot of people recommend that you leave photography to the experts. Um, last thing you want to do during something that's as rare and fleeting as a total eclipse is get caught up in trying to make your equipment work and then it's it's gone, so you don't want to uh, take that risk, right? Um, I had some automated stuff set in time, um, set up to, to run and took some images that were uh, kind of okay, but it definitely wouldn't have been worth uh, missing the eclipse for. Uh, during um, totality, whether um, you're observing with your unaided eye or camera or telescope, you can remove the filters. Uh, but like Phil said, you got to be aware of time so that you're not as surprised like he was when um, when you, that unfiltered photosphere sunlight hits you at third contact. You probably don't want to be at a telescope eyepiece. I think Phil will probably try to avoid that next time. I think Phil's word was he got he got zapped. Yeah. I was actually filtered. It was just the brightness of the, the flash at that point. You were filtered. Yeah, and then I took off the filter at the, uh, okay. right after the flash uh, for the, when the totality was happening. Okay, let's see. Let's move on. There's your pin, pinhole projection, camera obscura kind of stuff that we learned about in grade school, just variations of that. How fancy you want to get about it is is up to you. Um, so, so wrap this up here. Talk about what I've got planned uh, coming up in the 
uh, the months ahead. Uh, basically, what I intend to do is take the, um, well, after the 2017 eclipse, um, at the uh, the next month's HAL monthly meeting, I basically gathered and, and curated um, all of HAL members and guests' experiences and organized those into a presentation. And probably, I actually talked about it at, Phil, at the last meeting where Bill had us talk about our best um, experience. And I, that was one of mine was presenting um, Hal's experience at the um, uh, 2017 uh, uh, eclipse. Uh, in that, there's a lot of things that we that we learned just by how we experienced the eclipse. And what I'd like to do is uh, review that. Uh, gives you a, uh, somebody that hasn't uh, seen an eclipse, uh, perhaps newer members uh, that are just now becoming interested in astronomy. Um, just so now you know a little bit about how an eclipse works and what it is. What is it like to go see one? What kind of things you need to be thinking about uh, when you plan to go see an eclipse? And uh, what are some of the things that can um, uh, jump up and, and bite you that you need to be uh, ready for or, or might not expect? And certainly you wouldn't want any of these things to interfere with uh, somebody's eclipse. Eclipse, eclipse experience in 2024. So we'll just try to tease out those uh, lessons learned to help prepare for the um, 2024 eclipse. Um, as the time for the eclipse approaches, I'll probably release a couple of emails asking uh, folks to uh, record both uh, in written form, narrative form, and uh, photographs uh, what your experience was and um, and if um, Phil or whoever's president in 2024 will permit, I will do a part three and that will be bringing together into one presentation uh, what Hal experienced in the 2024 eclipse. And, uh, and the 2020, uh, 2017 uh, presentation Got a lot of very positive feedback from that, that, uh, that people really enjoyed that. A lot of interaction, uh, folks like Phil and Wayne and Bob Prokop and um, many others that actually went, shared their stories uh, firsthand when slides about what they had done came up in that presentation. So that, um, that will be a, a really good uh, experience for all of us to, to um, share that together. I've got some additional resources here. I, this will be posted and um, uh, be able to look at these at your own leisure. Uh, the one that I do want to, the two that I want to point out is the, uh, the second one there is um, uh, my presentation in 2017. So you can take a look at that ahead of time if you'd like. And um, uh, and then the last one, Xavier Juvier, uh, was one of the resources that I relied on heavily for the um, 2017 eclipse. I see Wayne shaking his head. Um, if you want to know, um, it's, I mean, you talk it's like it's based on Google Maps, and you can. Uh, that's how I knew I was 100 feet from the center line um, where I uh, set up shop. Uh, you can tell exactly where the center line is, and once you Pick that spot. You can um, you can tell exactly when uh, first, second, th and third contacts are going to occur. Uh, how long the duration of uh, totality? Uh, everything that you want to know. I actually used it. To, I I mapped out ten um, alternate sites, and based on the weather, I picked uh, one of those. Um, and those sites have been picked out like weeks before I. Uh, travel to uh, Kentucky. So that's that's it. Um, all the, the the biggest takeaway I can leave you with is this is not something you want to miss. If there's any way that you can do it, uh, please plan to uh, get out and see this eclipse. I'm uh, in 2017. We were already talking about this one. I don't know when another opportunity 
this good is going to come along. It certainly won't be um, uh, seven years, seven or eight years. So with that, I'll wrap it up here and um, open the floor for uh, for questions. Thanks, Jim. As always, uh, great presentation, very well prepared. Uh, gets everybody excited for 2024, which is really just three years away. So um, a little less than three years now. Uh, so it's, it's going to come up quickly. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments for, for Jim? Just unmute yourself. Yep, I've got a question. Go ahead. Um, so my question was, for the past like few years or so, um, there's been a lot of eclipses coming up in places other than the USA. So like whenever I search up when an eclipse, eclipse is coming in USA, it like almost is not really possible for an eclipse to come in the USA really like early around that time. So all the eclipses happen in other countries. So uh, my question is, why don't eclipses happen in the US as often as they happen in other countries? Well, um, I would I would say that if you take any other one country, um, um, they don't happen very often there, you know, that um, they happen all over the world um, all the time. I couldn't talk to the frequency, but um, but I don't think there's any one single country that um, that um, that gets more eclipses than we do. We we have a pretty large land mass, so we probably uh, see more than than most countries. Same with like uh, Russia and China, large land masses. They probably see more than a than a small place like smaller country like um, you know Spain or France or, or even Germany. As far as you, there are people that um, there are eclipse chasers. And as Jim just stated, they happen in different parts of the world um, every couple of years for totality or, or, or less frequently. And um, there's people that that's what they do. They chase eclipses all over the year. And it's a, it's a big risk. It's a lot of expense and it's an adventure and you just never know what's gonna happen uh, with the weather. Uh, just ask uh, Albert Einstein. <laughs> uh, um. You know, yeah. having to wait a long time for the next event. So yeah, I just read that about Albert Einstein's some um, discovery using a solar eclipse in a book recently. Right. Yeah. So thanks for the question. Friend. Thanks, Arjun. Anybody else? Jim, uh, great presentation. Could you go back to that slide that with the Bailey's beads? Uh, yeah. I'm. That was new to me. And could you talk maybe more about that? You were Wayne. I'll let Wayne have a shot at it. I'm not sure what you're looking for, but uh, Bailey's beads, I assume everybody can hear me. Bailey's yeah. beads are the last vestiges of the photosphere shining through between the peaks of mountains along the limb of the moon. So the Bailey's beads that you see when you observe a, a solar eclipse depend critically upon where you're at in the eclipse. Okay, it, uh, did I, I'm not sure what you're asking about, but okay. so okay. It's, it's literally the last little bit of visible photosphere shining between mountains on the edge of the moon. So you're talking about the lower right of that image? or Yes, the, the really left? bright stuff. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. the, the really bright stuff there down around, what is that, about 5 o'clock-ish, if you imagine a clock face. Okay. And the, the bluish in the upper left? That's just an internal reflection in the camera of those Bailey's beads. I mean, if you want to look at the detail in the uh, Bailey's beads, look at that bluish area. So, Wayne, it's the... Is what I would have think that what this is showing at the lower right is the diamond ring effect. No, well, it's it's Bailey's beads. Uh, diamond ring effect is usually just just the last of the Bailey's beads. Okay. It's the last one you see. Yeah. I, I would say that Bailey's beads and diamond ring effect are very closely related, and, and in time they happen like just almost instantaneously. Yeah. I would venture that. Except that the Bailey beads last. 
you know, the diamond ring is a flash. That right. depends. It depends on the specifics of the eclipse, though. If yeah. if the moon is much bigger than the you know uh, than the apparent uh, size of the sun, the Bailey's beads stop because right. you know the you're not seeing any photosphere between the peaks of the mountains. Right. So if the moon is really similar in size, or if you're far from the center line, then the Bailey's beads can can last. But the diamond ring effect is really just the, the last of the Bailey's beads. Right. Yeah, so, I would venture that if the moon and sun are, are extremely close to the same size, the moon perhaps is marginally larger, you could um, potentially see Bailey's beads all the way around. Uh, in principle, if you were exactly on the center line, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I was right on the center line for the last one. Uh, in Missouri, and uh, it was it was quite incredible. But I, you know, we can't if if you haven't seen um, by a show of hands, how many people have seen a, uh, a total eclipse in person? Okay, so, so quite a few. So you, you you know that it's really really quick, and you know as Jim pointed out, this one's going to give us a relatively long exposure. Would you say, Jim, up to about four minutes, right? And this one, I think about right four place. minutes, yeah. Um, so I was at a place in the last one where was I had two minutes and like thirty six seconds, which was quite a long time for for this last one. Um, it wasn't the maximum uh, point, but um, and you're trying to take it all in, and it goes and it ends quickly. Uh, that that two two and a half minutes was was a fast two and a half minutes. Uh, so you really got to be prepared, prepared. And so when Jim said, if you, you know, I, I took the advice of not trying to image it and just to enjoy it. And I'm glad I did, because if you just take a, any amount of time to, um, with the technology, you, you're going to miss the observation part. Yeah, and I'll tell you, this was my first total eclipse and I was just totally blown away by it. And as you can tell, I did take some photos but I, my advice is if it's your first eclipse in particular, plan to take photos, but when totality starts, forget your camera stuff. Just totally forget it. Automate it as much as you can, then forget it. You'll either get something or you won't. Don't worry about it. Enjoy the eclipse. Yeah. Um, part of the uh, part two presentation is um, be some things to consider um, writing down to have with you to because if you don't, if you don't have something written down to look at, there's so many things to see. And you know, okay, do I see stars? Do I see the um, uh, the sunset on the horizon? Do I see animals? Is it cooler? Am I see in shadow bands. That's a lot of things to remember to look for. So having something written down is um, highly recommended. So we'll uh, tr try to gather a list of things uh, to look for. I agree with writing it down, but. I'd want you to, I'd suggest committing that list to memory because the eclipse has happened so suddenly, the totality phase especially happened so suddenly, you don't want to be staring at a piece of paper. <laughs> well, um, shows in, my, up. in my case, after I've just lost my mind uh, without a piece of paper, I'm, I'm <laughs> probably not going to be any good. But the bottom yeah, line yeah, is... Yeah, but that, losing your mind is a good thing in this case. <laughs> it sure is. But the bottom line was like with most successful outings for astronomy, um, it's planning ahead. And, um, you know, as the eclipse gets closer and when Jim, uh, when he does his review of the 2017 and preparing for 2024, that's a really good time to start making that checklist for what to plan for. And I don't want to open it all up today because it's a long time away, but there were a lot of things that uh, you just can't, you know, you, you have to be ready for. Yeah, I think about 16 or 18 months out is time sure to do part all, two. All, so you can start making long range plans. Yeah, and you got to make sure they all have their own way to, to observe what they could do. You know, if you're sitting with a telescope, you don't have time to keep having people pop in and out and look through your telescope. Make sure they have their own device, their own binocular, whatever it is. Or um, so it just happens too quick to be um, passing things along. So, but. We'll get into a lot of it as it gets closer. Uh, Jim, uh, great presentation. Um, 
along the path of totality for 2024, what area has the best chance of visibility? I'm from Buffalo and it's, it's cloudy uh, very often. Uh, we'll, for example, we'll talk about weather and climate, but right now I can tell you it's, uh, Texas is going to be your uh, best chance of a uh, uh, cloudless sky in April. Mexico. Texas right down on near the border. Yeah. Not not Dallas. Dallas, not Dallas. is sort of if iffy yeah. in April. You want to stay I'm thinking Austin or, or more south. Yeah, you want to stay away from the eastern Texas and you know it, it'll end up going through San Antonio in New Mexico doing nothing but getting longer and better. And also your chances of having better skies are as you head in that direction too. But the other thing is, and that's out of the control to a degree of the observer, but you know, the ideal thing would be to be able to shoot the, the eclipse early before the atmosphere starts boiling. If you've got an eclipse happening through West Texas or Mexico by noon, you're going to have a ton of turbulence. Um, if, you know, if it happens, that, that, but then if it's early, it's lower in the sky too, and you're shooting through more atmosphere. So it's kind of a wash. If you just enjoy it visually and don't worry so much about the imaging. My yeah, I mean, when you talk about, you know, sort of getting confused or whatever, I had an app on my phone that would, that would orally call out the contacts and give you warning ahead of time. And I had that playing in the background, actually, while my phone was taking a movie of everybody and everything. And actually, all of the people around me were very help. Uh, they very much liked the fact that there was this app out there telling them what was coming up and giving them warning and how long it was going to be and when they were in mid, you know, mid totality. And you know, and because it, it does, it changes its timing just based upon uh, you know geolocating from your phone. And it worked. It worked wonderfully. You didn't you know, you weren't stressed, you know, somebody, it's somebody else is doing the job of telling you how much longer you've got before the next contact is coming. Cool. And I'm hopefully the guy will produce another one for the 24 eclipse. Sounds like having your own tour guide there. Of course. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really nice. But how many of us have gone to a nice tourist attraction to see and enjoy the serenity of the site, only to have a tour guide lecturing a bunch of people that just came <laughs> off the bus? <laughs> just like the guy that shows up at the star party with the uh, you know animated postage stamp app on his smartphone blaring. So, <laughs> well, I found an isolated park in a small town in Nebraska where it was clear. And uh, people just slowly over time came up, but there were probably no more than 50 people total in this park watching the eclipse. It was just gorgeous, you know, there was not a cloud in the sky. One of the things that I'll recommend in, in part two is to plan for not having mobile connectivity because you get millions of people uh, influxing into the uh, areas of uh, the, the center line, the path of totality, especially down in South Texas where the weather's more likely to be clear, there's nothing down there. So um, you need to plan on not having, plan, certainly plan on having that app and access to it. Or, or um, I don't know if it's, um, if it needs a live connection or not, but- No, um, it was on the phone. It just, okay. you know, just needs GPS and nothing stops GPS. Yeah. So it, yeah. But these are great points. And you know we're we're not going to be waiting till 2023 to start talking about some of them because you know planning where you're going to be and mm -hmm. potential alternates based on all kinds of situations. You know some we can't uh, we can't anticipate, but uh, and the weather part is always a guess. You yeah. know so you're using probabilities and um, you know all those uh, materials that I actually paid for and stuff for the last one. Which were very useful at the time and completely of no use, you know, uh, the minute the eclipse ended. <laughs> um, but uh, th those tools will all be available again, and then it's just you know the, the luck of the draw, 
and you know did you pick a good spot you know for, for weather and everything else but you know having those plans you know this last one a lot of people went out to um, the mountains uh, up in the northwest and um, you're going to have you're going to have your longest uh, you're going to have your some of your best viewing there um, but if there was a problem there was only one way in and one way out and you would have never made it and um, um, I picked a spot where I had multiple ways to go if the weather got bad and it did and it's a long story in itself but those are the kind of things that we should, that we'll start talking about as a group um, probably within a, you know probably sometime in a, 2022 and early 2023. Yeah, and for this eclipse, I'm actually thinking about doing, you know, taking advantage of the new technology and doing what planetary observer imagers do and deep sky imagers do. The idea is collect all the photons, put your camera in time-lapse mode, say maybe 10 frames a second, and just 10 frames a second, take every bit of data on the eclipse, you know, during totality and put all of the stuff, you know, you'll have 2,400 frames. You can do all the HDR you want, you know, to get extended stuff from the, uh, you know, from the Corona out from that. You can, you know, you just, you have everything you can want. If you put it together in a movie, it'll turn it into, you know, like a minute and a half movie, which is more fun to watch than a four minute movie but you just, you collect all the photons from the thing and then you go in and you do all of your imagery after the fact. Have, and have then you, you have one telescope. Have you, have you tried that? No, I don't have the camera oh, that I have today. Okay, I'm gonna- Today I, I have an I'm electronic- gonna you, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you something from your experience. Okay. Uh, if you try that, you'll wish you had set your intervalometer for one, photo every 10 seconds rather than 10 per second. Um, let me see David if I can- a magnificent picture. Let me see if I can find time. something that uh, maybe uh, my wife, Leona, who is also on with us here, uh, did. Uh, and then uh, when I do find it, which I will, uh, let's see here. I'm searching the light room right now. Oh, while David's looking, does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments for Jim? Jim, I want to thank you again for all the prep time and the presentation. Um, it's great. And um, we'll be certainly looking forward to uh, uh, the, next, uh, the next session related uh, to follow on to this one. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome, and thank you for letting me do this. Really enjoyed it. That's great. So, David, no rush. I'm going to um, jump into the pictures, David, and then you just let me know when you're ready. And we can uh, I, I, I am ready. Okay, well, then you go right on in. Oh, okay. No pressure there, buddy. <laughs> None at all. Uh, no pressure, but yeah, just take your time there, Dave. Yeah. Uh, well, it's right. it, it's it, <laughs> it's it, it, it's it's Mac. It's got security, and uh, and I have to give permission for you to uh, record the screen. Oh, you, you, you can get it through the Chinese it, server. Uh, uh, there you go. If not. Okay. Now let's see here. Now, it, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, there you go. I, I can't do it because I have to quit uh, okay. Zoom and restart to, to, uh, share, to share the screen. If we could see your screen, so okay. okay. Oh, 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 could you? Yeah. Uh, there you go, we can see your screen. Oh yeah, no, for if you're trying oh, that, that, that's- There you go. This is, this is Leona's picture and I guarantee you it wasn't 10 frames per second. Uh, yes. It, no. No. It, I'm. I'm talking about uh, 500 millimeter lens uh, on my on a driven mount. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and basically just you know run it at don't run it at quite video rates. Run it at uh, you know like a third speed for yeah. video rates, but just do yeah. 
you know, constant exposures and then just stack the images and stack the images and do HDR to get long, you know, coronal lines coming out of my image and, and, and just say, okay, I've collected essentially every photon because my dead time is so tiny. I, I've essentially collected every photon from the eclipse. So now I can recreate the eclipse afterwards. And then I just take my one camera and one lens and the smaller tracking mount and it's much more reliable. And then the rest of the cameras are set up. I, I like to do wide angle photography to just show and doing video to just show what's what's going on in the environment. What are the other people saying and talking about? And, yeah. you know, you've got the sun up there in the sky and, well, you know, and it's. Uh, just just ask anyone who photographed the uh, the 2017 eclipse. Uh, you 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 you're, you're you're overkilling it. You're overthinking it. In yeah. in my opinion, you don't need all of that to catch this kind of picture. Right. This is a great. Well, topic. no, not yeah. not that. I mean, I I did the 2017 eclipse. Yeah. Uh, I use. You, yeah. You, you don't need HDR. Uh, which will, you know, has that 1950s postcard look to it. Well, Jim Johnson might disagree. Yeah, but hang on, you guys. So let's 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 uh, let's pause this uh, conversation right. till so. because when it's getting closer, um, we're going to dedicate a session. I may not be president then. Um, <laughs> somebody else who's who's president by that time. We'll uh, punish you and make you be president. Then. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I like being president, so this is not a burden at all. Um, of that, but I like being president of this group. Uh, I'll certainly uh, hold off my presidents and wishes in, in other areas. But the, uh, um, but we, we we will dedicate a session, I'm sure, to different methodologies for imaging because there are different things to accomplish, like Jim was talking about, and people have different experiences. So this would be a great thing to talk about when it gets closer, where we can apply it. And and our and our zoom to your question that you put on chat, um, you know what, what Jim was talking about is we everything's going to be lined up perfectly. That's why we know the eclipse is going to happen. You know, it's not going to be where the if the if the uh, the apparent size of the the uh, moon is smaller than the apparent size of the disk, then it wouldn't be a total eclipse. Um, and uh, so we know that everything's going to be right for the 2024 eclipse. So that, that, you know, everything will be positioned correctly. If it's not, we'll have other things to worry about. So, <laughs> um, so there's that. So I'm gonna move on. Once again, Jim, thank you very much. And uh, great job. And let me move on to our uh, pictures that uh, have been submitted for, for this month. And if I missed anybody, I looked really hard to make sure I didn't miss anybody. I'll apologize up front and I'll, we'll get them in for next month. Just let me know that I missed your picture. Um, so uh, Bruce, uh, you're on, right? Bruce? Well, Bruce submitted this picture of M13. I don't know if he's on, I thought he was gonna be here. He's not here, okay. So, and so did uh, Steve. And uh, obviously using different telescopes and different um, exposure times. Steve, you're on, right? Yep, I'm here. There you go. All right, so, so I had uh, I needed to uh, test some guiding out and see how long I could guide for because I usually can't get more than a six five six minutes. I tried two, I tried ten minutes, and I got a good frame. So I took a second ten minute frame for a total of twenty minutes of M thirteen, stacked them, processed them, and that's what you see here. So that worked out nice. This is a crop version of what I originally um, had taken. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, love globulars. Uh, and this is kind of a, uh, I, I call this my throwaway picture. Um, back last year, I did uh, this uh, M94 Cat's Eye Galaxy. And I decided recently, since I got new tools, let me go back and reprocess it, reprocess it, reprocess it from scratch. And I did that just, what, two nights ago and just took the old data. Um, uh, it was already stacked. I just reprocessed it with the other tools. And I kind of like this one better. It's really only the central core of the galaxy. You should see a lot more stuff going on. But I didn't have a good night that, that last year when I was trying to capture. Um, so uh, this is kind of the best I could get in terms of the amount of data. I only got 72 minutes of data um, uh, with the SCT. 
but reprocessing it, it looks a lot better. I was able to get saturation a little better. Uh, you're just missing the outer bands of the galaxy, just getting the central core here. Great. Thank you. Great. Jim. Hey, hello. This is, hello. Uh, yep. This is the Whirlpool with an uh, eight inch reflector uh, last week or the week before, something like that, just this month. And uh, it's my first shot of something that um, for that long, I kind of, I guess for that long, it's about an hour's worth of data, uh, 30 second uh, frames for about an, uh, up to up to an hour's worth. And uh, yeah, I'm trying, I got Photoshop, so I'm, I'm playing with that a little bit more. Like what Steve just said, I want to try and reprocess some old photos, but this is my, kind of my attempt and just to see what would come out. Very good. Very good. Thank you. And Brad. Uh, yeah, this is yet another picture of M81 and M82. It's a two frame mosaic with a new scope I bought at the beginning of the year, much longer focal length. So that's been quite a learning curve. Well, it appears you did a good job of learning. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Very nice. If anybody has any questions for these guys, uh, these folks that when uh, they're showing their pictures, please jump right in. And um, this is James. James, are you on? So James uh, always has uh, really great pictures. And, um, you know, I'm learning from trying to do some planetary stuff myself that um, even when you have great focus, you have to have enough bits to work with. And so you really need to have a lot of focal length uh, to, get to, 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 to get this much uh, detail in order to process it and everything. So That's gorgeous. That is so gorgeous. It's yeah. my favorite planet. So he, he he does a he does good work, and then here's here's one view of Jupiter from James, and you can see the uh, the the giant red spot right there, and and also this moon here is um, uh, I want to pronounce it correctly Gamma Gamma Me Gamma Wayne Gamma Gamma Me <laughs> right so, Andy Mead yeah there you go that's why I take Wayne with me everywhere he's my astronomical interpreter so. Uh, and uh, so he, and then yeah, that's he, why Phil's always in so much trouble. <laughs> and uh, here's a, here's a, another view of Jupiter as it, it rotated around. So, and then uh, this is my picture that I took on uh, May 31st of the sun. And this was actually flaring. So as you know, Jim pointed out during the eclipse when he was showing uh, the activity off the edge, which is a prominence, um, you know, where flare is really a verb and something that's happening. And you could tell this was flaring by just how bright this is. And it was getting brighter and brighter as I was imaging it. And it's one of the cool things in this image that I really like is, is there is around sunspots and other areas that are white that are called plages, um, is you could see the magnetic field activity and how that's uh, impacting the plasma here on the chromosphere. And so Phil, is that double stack or single stack? This is a double stack. So okay. this is 0.5 angstroms. Thanks. Yep. So um, here's a, another image. Uh, you, um, this is just taken minutes apart um, using um, the hydrogen alpha telescope and a, and, a, and a telescope with a white light filter on it. So here, is the photosphere that Jim was talking about. You look at the photosphere and here you're looking at the chromosphere. Now, the reason for the difference in size is because this telescope is twice as large as this one. This, was a, a, this is a 60 millimeter um, Lunt hydrogen alpha telescope. Uh, and this is a 130 millimeter uh, five inch uh, refractor. So yeah, I'm able to get uh, you know closer in and everything. So that's why the sunspots are, are larger. But if I brought in the picture just of this, I can't enlarge it here. I don't know. Maybe. I think you have that labeled as a Questar 3.5. Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on. I'm sorry. You're right. Hold on. Let me go back. What did I just do here? Oh. That's right. Never mind. So this is the Questar 3. Oh. They're close. They're they're close. That's right. I keep thinking I was using my five inch, but so anyways, with the with the white light filter, you could see um, the you could clearly see the sunspots and around them the umbras and the penumbras, 
and you're because you're and you're looking at the photosphere here in the H alpha. Um, you, the sunspots are literally just like spots, but you could see, you know, how it's impacting. Once again, the magnetic fields are um, uh, their influence, and it almost looks like this one has a valley here uh, going on, and you see a small prominence over here. So I, I put these side by side because they were taken minutes apart using the exact same camera. I just pulled it off of one and moved it to the, and put it on the other telescope. They were set up together. And I wanted to just give the perspective of the difference between looking at the chromosphere with H alpha and the photosphere with the, um, uh, with the white light. What, what might be really helpful one day is if we could have a class on how you, the process to, and the software that's used, because I hear terms like stacking and taking all of the photos and things of that nature. And I've watched a ton of YouTube uh, videos on, on these things. And then when I think I have an understanding of it, another video comes along and changes that. So I'd like to hear from some of our people, maybe on the next web, you know, whenever we have one of these meetings again, here's the process that I use. Here's what I found to be good. Here's what I found to be not so good. And this is what you can do to get the best pitches possible. It would really be helpful. Right, Mike. And that is definitely in the plans. And it's probably, we'll probably do it a couple of different ways. Um, for the solar, which is a different, which has similarities, but it's a different effort in, in processing solar images than it is deep sky images. Um, and uh, so as part of the uh, Astro School that I'm gonna do on July 17th, I'm gonna get into that a little bit and then probably do a follow-on session on Zoom where people could actually all see the processing happening. And for the planetary and the deep sky, It'll be a series of sessions that are using Astro School as well as our monthly event, because there's there's several people have different ways of doing things. There's a I say a common um, uh, foundation, if you will, that everybody builds off of. But people use different tools and they have different methodologies and different experiences, and um, um, and but we wanted so we want to take it from beginner's level and then there's a session we've been talking about for this for the very advanced people that already are really well experienced but want to find newer ways or better ways to do different things so yes mike um that is coming i hey, great hey, I'm phil, hey, phil yes thank you hey, john john gladden i nominate steve uh, rifkin for that uh the, the run that 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 video session for beginners and how to uh put together a, uh, a, a imaging train, uh, cause he's very good at it. So I, 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 I think that John draft him. Yes. I, I, I find that Steve charges a lot of money. Lots. You know, you know, lots and lots, you know, so. <laughs> um, well, Steve, you've been volunteered. Are you up for it? Uh, maybe I'm not sure how good I am presenting it. I, I work pretty well with one to one on one. I'm not good with setting up the presentation, but maybe I'll work with a couple other of my astro photo friends who are part of how maybe we can put together like a okay. type of presentation. Yeah, and, and what I'd like to do is just, you know, if we just have a dedicated session to these things where we set a, you know, set up the Zoom and we've planned it for a couple hours because one hour will be seem like a total eclipse. It'll go by so quick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just amazing. And I yeah, think and, that's it for And for Mike, What's I'd that? like to, I'd like to point out that this is a really good idea, but you have to go into it understanding that the process and the steps that you use depend on your equipment, whether you're using a monochrome camera or a, a one-shot color or whatever, and whether and what software you're using. So, you know, the difference, there's certainly some common, some common things to do, but how you do them and how, how you actually accomplish it depends critically in particular on your uh, software. And, and, and that's a great point. And in watching these videos, you know, right now I'm going to just use my regular camera and attach it to my telescope. But And that's you know, great. Which, which type of camera should I invest in? What's going to be the easiest to use? That's, just so I don't make the same mistakes that I've made in the past. With well, that's a different topic on right. choosing right. which cameras and stuff. I'm in that, I'm in that uh, personal place right now myself. Okay. Could we potentially do a like a survey of here's the type of cameras we have, or here's the type of scopes, and then 
you have a session based up on that, you know, you know depending on the type of camera, is it DSLR? Is it something more like a, a, ZS, a ZWO type camera? And then that might attract different audiences to help learn. Well, to be honest, I'd, I'd want to attend all the sessions because if I have a DLS on today, but in the future, I may want to migrate to a ZWO. I want to know the benefits of both. So, Absolutely. But if you have one and you're looking to learn how to use it better, yep, I think yep. this would be good. And then, yeah, you can definitely learn and say, hey, this is something different. I, I'd love to see that. That'd be pretty cool. Yep. Agreed. Did we lose Phil? Because it's all of a sudden Chaz seems to be the uh, host. All right, Chaz, go. Okay, I'm the host, huh? <laughs> That's what Zoom told me. That's weird. I wonder how come I got made the host. I don't even think I was the second one to join. <laughs> I think I was third or fourth in, so I'm not sure why I became the host. <laughs> Let's give Phil, I, we should probably give Phil a minute. I got kicked off a few minutes ago. So maybe he's coming back on. He may be just talking and not even know he's kicked off. <laughs> yeah, but you got kicked off for bad behavior, though. That's different. Well, I, I don't disagree with you there. Is there a coup going on? Oh, it says Phil's the host again now. Hey, I'm back. My computer crashed. Oh, well, yes, we didn't know you were gone. We have a crash right in the middle of this thing. So, um, oh, were you gone, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything was going so smooth. Yeah. The, the next one who speaks is president. Next. <laughs> Boy, it got quiet quick. Hey. <laughs> so, um, so, can I change the subject for a second? Going back to uh, John, to your. Um, your point, you know, I was saying with the cameras and stuff, I'm in that decision, but for these processing classes, I've been talking to Dale Gant and Dale's got some data that um, I want to share out to everybody. So everybody's got the same data set. And that mm -hmm. way you'll be able to process everybody using the same data set, because as Wayne was pointing out, it makes a difference on, on what you're doing. So at least for, uh, let's say a classroom environment, if everybody has the same data set to work with, then you could compare each other's processing things as you're going through and practice with those and then go back and practice with your own data because it's, it's hard in a group environment when everybody's working with different data and trying to do you know, the same problem you have when you're watching YouTube. You're watching YouTube with somebody who's using their set of data, their tools and everything else, and it's gonna be different than what you're doing. So if you, everybody has the same thing, at least for the classroom environment, for let's call it classroom, um, uh, uh, semester one, uh, that would be great. So, what is, does that sound okay to you guys and everybody? Maybe Absolutely Phil? agree. Absolutely agree. Okay. Hey, Phil. Um, uh, just last week, uh, John Nagy, another HAL member, and I, uh, John found a website that had some sample data, and we decided, hey, let's just try pulling down the data and each independently trying to process it our way and see what comes out, what we liked about the other persons and so far, and so forth. And uh, worked out really nicely. Right. And we plan to do more of that. So that sounds great for like getting that kind of data and having a lot of people be able to, to practice on it. Yeah. So, and I, I'd like to do that, not during a monthly meeting because not everybody is into the imaging and, um, and I don't want to, you know, lose half of the crowd because they don't have the tools or the desire uh, to do that and just hold a dedicated session or sessions um, at a different time where you know the people who are interested in this, everybody could join in. So, and there's uh, Zoom is such a good tool for this, uh, better than even sitting in the classroom. So, uh, and especially if you could have a couple of, if you, if you could have two windows running uh, at the same time where you could be doing some processing and then you could share your screen and show it to everybody else and get some advice and we could pop back and forth. So we'll, we'll um, there's, there's so many things that we could do with Zoom, including we could um, even set up some different rooms. So if we have different, um, uh, let's call them uh, uh, processing professors, 
say that 100 times real fast. If we have uh, different processing professors, we could set up different rooms. So if somebody's doing planetary and somebody wants to do solar and somebody wants to do deep sky, we, you could just jump into those rooms yourself during the same session. And it's pretty cool. I've been in part of that in some other meetings. And uh, you kind of start out already together in the main room and then you break out your breakout sessions. And then uh, at the end of the, the, the night or whatever it is, you everybody gets back together and shares whatever experiences you had in the other room. So lots of cool things that we could do using this tool. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm, you know, this is the best thing. When we have these conversations, it really sets up the, the future of our get togethers. Um, and with that said, I know we're getting close to uh, our nine o'clock hour. And, you know, the timing worked out really well today. Um, I do want to remind everybody that this Saturday uh, is sundown and starts our, um, our first in-person public star party. And um, even one night in the past, when we've been clouded out, we've had between 50 and 150 people show up um, and they stay and we, we have uh, great conversations, uh, talking about all different kinds of topics. Uh, Halo is not going to be open. Uh, for use uh, yet, as we're still working through some, um, uh, some actually not even so much COVID protocol anymore, but we have to get our, our um, CTOs, our certified telescope operators and our CTAs, our certified telescope uh, assistants uh, trained up on the new things that have been implemented. So that is now the reason that uh, uh, the observatory is still closed for use and just until we get those people done, so done uh, trained. So there's gonna be some emails going out uh, for to our current uh, list of um, certified telescope operators uh, to schedule with uh, Dale and, and, and Joel and some others to, um, to get trained and then we'll get the observatory back into full swing again. Anything else, anybody has anything you wanna cover, you wanna talk about, suggest? Hey, Phil. Yes. So, I'm going to toot my own horn for a second and say that I work for NASA at the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, tomorrow, the U.S. Postal Service is releasing a set of 10 stamps. They call them the Sun Science Stamps, and they'll have 10 different pictures taken from the Solar Dynamics Observatory satellite. Great. So are they going to be ready for um, purchase tomorrow? I believe tomorrow, yes. Okay. So I don't know if mailing or stamp collecting is still a thing, but I'm pretty excited. Yeah, I, no, I'm gonna go. I'll go get some myself. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And uh, so, do you uh, do you uh, have visitors that could come see what you do in the Solar Dynamics Observatory over there at Goddard? Uh, not right now. Goddard is still closed. Yeah. Visitors. Okay. So I'm interested when you do. Okay. You do. I'll, I'll keep you in mind. Yeah. Make it a field outing. A lot of us would like that. Yeah. Yeah, we could arrange a field trip. Uh, for sure. Oh yeah. So Dominic, is your uh, is your mic working now? I think it is. Can you hear me? Yeah. So why don't you tell everybody what you're doing real quick and uh, let us know what you thought of the meeting tonight. Uh, great. So I've actually been to the two previous uh, two previous meetings, the radio astronomy meeting, um, as well as the the other meeting we had uh, between uh, then and now. Um, I started kind of astronomy in mid 2019 when I purchased a, a 130 millimeter Newtonian. Um, and I've always really been interested in the physical sciences and astronomy. So hoping to find a community here and just try to, you know, find some other people interested. Right. Right. And you're still in school, right? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. There you go. There you he go. takes some great pictures. All right. Well, we'd love to see him. He just, uh, <laughs> Email them over to me and uh, we'll get them in the meetings. Thank you. That's good. Anything else anybody's doing that's, uh, that's interesting? No? Okay, so watch for the impromptus. I'm looking forward to opening up either park. I, I, the reason I did Cars Mill the other night is I'm trying to teach myself on how to do some unguided um, um, Milky Way imaging with just a camera and a camera lens. And uh, you could get the Milky Way at uh, Cars Mill. And um, there, was a, there was a small crowd, but I was out till midnight uh, the other night. So we'll, we'll um, uh, you know, as so we have clear nights, uh, we're gonna open up as long as there's a volunteer to do that. 
Have anything else? If not, I want to thank Jim once again for his excellent presentation tonight. And I want to thank all of you for, uh, for joining and for your participation. And I look forward to seeing many of you this Saturday or in a future event or and or in a future event. So have a great weekend. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And uh, we'll talk with you soon. So take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Bill. Thanks, Bye. Phil. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. And watch for the recording if you want it.